afternoon and good evening. My name is Stacy Frost and I am the Director of Organizational Effectiveness. I am thrilled to have Professor Dariush Mohammedpour with us here today. Professor Dariush is a renowned scholar and has worked at the Institute of Ismaili Studies for 22 years. He is the author of the book, Authority Without Territory, the first study of the Ismaili Imamate in contemporary times. Today, we'll have the opportunity to discuss the linkages between the Ismaili Imamate and the Aga Khan Development Network and the role His Highness the Aga Khan plays as a spiritual leader and at the same time as the chairman of the AKDN institutions. Zooming in a bit, I have been with AKF for several years now, but only recently had the chance to visit Northern Pakistan. It was such an incredible experience to see His Highness's vision of long-term commitment and community-led development and practice. AKRSP and its work is embedded within the communities and the impact of the broader AKDN and its commitment to improving the quality of life is visibly equal. For me, it continues to be so humbling to be part of something so significant. Zooming out though, we will explore the connection between the Ismaili Imam and the AKDN, which is really critical for truly understanding the AKDN's approach to development. As Professor Dariush has said, and can elaborate on further, this sometimes requires unlearning what you, un uh, unlearning what you know to understand something in greater depth. Today's event will last about 60 minutes. Please feel free to submit your questions for Dariush using the Q&A button at the top of your screen or the question mark button if you are joining from a phone anytime throughout the presentation. We will try to get to as many of your questions as possible at the end of the presentation. We will also be playing some audio and video clips today. If your connection isn't good enough for the audio connection, the visual reference will be available on screen. Professor Dariush, it is a privilege to speak to you about this important topic. We thank you for taking the time to join this AKF live event. Your work is focused on the establishment of the AKDN within the framework of a cosmopolitan ethic. Those of us who have worked with the AKDN for some time have often heard this term, and indeed today's session is called the Cosmopolitan Ethic in Action. Can you explain to us in a bit more detail what is meant by the Cosmopolitan Ethic and how it is put into action? What kind of leadership is needed to sustain it? Hello, Stacy. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, hello, everyone from any part of the world that you're joining the session today. It's uh, a, uh, an honor and a, a pleasure for me to be uh, joining the AKF family today to discuss the AKDN and the uh, approach of the Ismaili Imamat to uh, issues of improving the quality of life around the globe. So going back to this issue of cosmopolitan ethic, there are, there are a couple of points that I need to uh, uh, mention before we move ahead. The first point, as you indicated in uh, your introductory remarks, is about what you call unlearning, and I would put it in slightly different terms, uh, and I would call it defamiliarization. There is a phrase that uh, Russian formalists use in, in, in the context of literature and literary uh, criticism. And uh, uh, the person who is responsible for introducing this into that literature is Viktor Shklovsky, for those of you who might uh, know a little bit about it. And uh, the idea is that when we are dealing with a text or an idea that we are too familiar with, we always need to take a step back. So we need to defamiliarize ourselves with it. This is called the estrangement theory. So the simple idea is that the people, the example would be this, the people who live uh, near the sea do not often hear the sounds of the waves of the sea. But somebody who just comes to the city for the first time and who's not from that place, they, they pick it up very quickly because it's it's new to them. And this is true about uh, the people who work inside the AKDN uh, very often and also the people who are inside the Ismaili community because for many, many years they have been exposed to the guidance and the leadership of His Highness. And sometimes they take it for granted, sometimes it's too close for them to figure out what is the unique and distinct uh, qualities that you can find in this type of leadership. So when you talk about cosmopolitan ethic, uh, one of the po other points that you need to bear in mind is that there is a trajectory to the kind of terminologies that the Ismaili Imam has used over the past uh, uh, seven decades. And cosmopolitan ethic, of course, has a 
a history behind it. There is a background behind it. If I give you several other equivalents which may work within this context, the first and the most important thing is uh, improving the quality of life. Now, how is improving the quality of life connected with cosmopolitan ethic? The first idea which comes into mind about cosmopolitanism is hospitality, is being open to the other, is uh, taking the other who is not like us seriously and looking at the other not as a source of uh, uh, risk or threat, but as a source of learning. So the other becomes epistemologically and philosophically important. Now, when we talk about cosmopolitan ethic, uh, there is there's a jargon here, but to, to put it in very, very simple terms, the way that His Highness puts it is that when we talk about cosmopolitan ethic, we are talking about an ethic for all people for all people, regardless of their denominations, regardless of their gender, regardless of their social status, regardless of their uh, different indices of difference that they have uh, in their day to day lives. Now, the other term which which suggests the same idea is, of course, back in the very title of this organization, the Ahan Development Network It is development. And of course, you could see that over the past couple of decades, uh, the term development has often been uh, interchangeably used uh, with uh, improving the quality of life because the term development itself uh, at some stages found some negative uh, connotations, particularly because of the kind of uh, European Eurocentric or Western kind of approaches to development. But what we see in improving the quality of life, and specifically when we talk about cosmopolitan ethic, is a, an acknowledgement, is an appreciation of the other who is not like us in a positive light, not in a negative light, not being seen as a threat. And therefore, when we talk about cosmopolitan ethic, we have development, we have improving the quality of life, we have keeping a balance between the material, this worldly aspects of human life and the spiritual aspects of their life and any other sphere of human life. And then we get to pluralism, which is the prerequisite for cosmopolitan ethic. And cosmopolitan ethic is an is is the is the theoretical uh, foundation for responding to the needs of human societies in their own times and looking at humanity without regard for their differences. Thank you, Professor. This this notion that the other is not just a source of threat it actually isn't a source of threat, which is often the perception, but actually a source of learning is quite interesting and in how that actually links to the concept of pluralism. I mean, His Highness has also said that he would sum up the central objective of the AKDN in one word, which is opportunity. This concept of opportunity also seems to be quite intertwined with the idea that the AKDN institutions were designed to solve the problems of the time. Can you elaborate on that idea a bit further? Thank you, Stacey. This is a very important point because when we talk about, uh, so before getting to, to, to the point about opportunity, let's go back and focus on problem. Now, this is particularly important in terms of methodology, and I deliberately use the term methodology because sometimes the people who look at the style of leadership of His Highness, uh, they often see it as a kind of a pragmatic uh, uh, approach to leadership, which is just uh, a, a normal European modern stuff. But it's a lot more sophisticated than that. And the sophistication lies exactly in the idea of dealing with problems, of offering solutions to problems that uh, could not be uh, solved through traditional methods, to use the words of His Highness. Now, I'm going to show you a, a uh, an extract from His Highness's speech in 1976 in Karachi. And now the context is that His Highness is talking about uh, the qualities of Prophet Muhammad, but there is a line in it and I've highlighted that line as you will see this, the, the slide, which deals with the methodology of the work. And that has got something to do with the way that the Ismaili Imamat operates in contemporary times and indeed with the entire approach of, of the Ismaili Imamat to addressing human needs uh, throughout centuries. So let me share this screen with you. Uh. 
This example is integrity, duality, honesty, generosity, both the means and the time, the solicitude for the poor, the weak and the sick, his steadfastness and friendship, his humanity and success, his magnanimity and victory, his simplicity, his wisdom in conceiving new solutions for problems which could not be solved by traditional methods without affecting the fundamental concepts of Islam. Surely, only the foundation, which correctly understood and sincerely interpreted, must enable us to conceive what should be a truly model and dynamic Islamic society. Uh, so as you could see here, the, the lines that I've highlighted, that there are actually two very important elements in it. The first one has got to do with having the wisdom to uh, address uh, new problems, emerging problems, in a creative way so that you do not reproduce old solutions. So if you run into a problem and your previous solutions, your traditional solutions, so to speak, fail to respond to those questions and they do not yield results anymore, it is your not just your right, but it's also your duty to go back, to revise them, to rethink those solutions, and if necessary, to even completely discard them and replace them with entirely new solutions. Now, what I've just explained and paraphrased from the language of His Highness is nothing other than what we call critical rationalism and philosophy of science. So the idea behind it in philosophy of science is that in science, theoretical uh, 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 scientific theories, or more specifically, our body of knowledge grows through a process of elimination of errors, through a process of rethinking the solutions that we have to new problems and to revise those solutions. So this is the first point, which is methodologically important. The second point is that His Highness is mentioning, now this is in the 70s, remember, he's referring to something as a truly modern dynamic uh, Islamic society. Now, this is, and uh, at least you've got two or three centuries of history behind this, and uh, that that shows the encounter between Muslim populations around the globe and this phenomenon of modernity, particularly in its European uh, uh, brand, so to speak. Now, let's remember that for the past uh, two or three centuries, up until the 70s, many of these populations where you've got uh, countries where you've got Muslim populations uh, 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 concentrated in them have been under the colonial rules. And coloniality and colonialism was closely associated with a European version of modernity. So in the beginning of the 18th and 19th century, the people among Muslim communities from different branches who were encountering this phenomenon, and of course they would, they, they felt that the Muslim communities are weak, are incapable of responding to the problems of their own time, and they, they felt a sense of decline. So the kind of responses that they provided to those problems uh, primarily belonged to two or three different categories. One of them was the uh, revivalist response, which was saying that, you know, something is wrong today. The reason that it's wrong today is that we have relinquished what we had in the past. So it is our job to go back to the past, to the early decades, to the early years of Islam and reproduce verbatim how the Prophet was responding to these problems and therefore the problem is going to be solved. And these are the people who are now known as the revivalist, the Salafists, who are the forefathers of the fundamentalist communities. The other one is, of course, the reformist approach of the people who thought that, uh, well, something has gone wrong, but it is a problem of the here and now, so we need to solve the problem of today with the means of today. Now, these are known as the Islahis or the reformists, and the prominent names among them could be mentioned as people like uh, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, uh, Muhammad Iqbal, and uh, uh, people of the same category. But where does the Ismaili Imamat fit in this narrative? The Ismaili Imamat is neither here nor there, and at a later stage I'll explain what I mean by that, because the key point is that you need to be able to address the problems of today with the means of today. 
Now, one of the most important elements of that point is that in particular in our times, every problem should be seen as an opportunity. Remember what I'm doing with this word. I mean, when you're looking at a problem, a problem is a unique opportunity for you to be able to grow your body of knowledge, to actually uh, enrich the repertoire of the solutions that you've got to those problems. So as a result, every single uh, problem that arises in our world, and of course we live in a world of, of increasingly emerging and, and, and interconnected problems around us, and the problems don't end. The only thing that we have is that our solutions always become this, uh, uh, become obsolete, but our uh, uh, problems don't ever disappear. They continue to be there. So the, the connection between opportunity has got something to do with problems, with emerging problems, which is part and parcel of life. If you're alive, you continue to have problems. It's only dead people who don't have any kind of problems. Dead people don't run into debt issues. They don't care about their rent. They don't care about any sickness or nothing. So problems are part and parcel of life, and that should be seen as an opportunity. Thank you, Professor. This framing of, you know, at the other as a as a learning opportunity and problems also as opportunity is a very positive approach. I mean, His Highness had said um, having the wisdom to revisit the solutions. And I also think it might be something about having the courage to revisit them and that courage to potentially fail. I mean, AKF has recently spent a lot of time focusing on innovative and innovative solutions to problems, and sometimes innovation has that risk of failure. Um, but it also gives you that ongoing opportunity to revisit challenges, to think about how to solve them in new ways. I mean, you've talked also about colonialism and you refer to different um, different times. I mean, AKDN now has, has been active for more than 50 years since it was established. I mean, what other major shifts have you noted during this time? Time, and how has this been reflected in the way His Highness speaks about his role and the role of AKDN? Uh, thank you. Uh, so the first point that I would like to, to, to mention before going to this, this issue of the shifts which have happened over the past 50 years, or let me say over the past 70 years, uh, is has got something to do with the point that I mentioned a little bit earlier about, about the issue of correcting mistakes, of eliminating errors, of being able to respond to problems of the time using the solutions of the time rather than remaining stagnant and remaining trapped in what we sometimes present as tradition. Uh, it's a sign of wisdom. You need to be intelligent to come up with new solutions. And this is particularly uh, 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 evident in the, in the response that His Highness gives to a question at an interview in Brown University recently in which he mentions something about our ability to correct our mistakes. And it's very interesting the way that he phrases this. So let me uh, show this uh, to you. Okay. I think I would start by saying something very basic. First of all, what language do you speak? Do you speak one or do you speak several languages? If you speak several languages, your horizons are wider. You can function in a wider number of countries around the world. I think the second thing I would say is I would ask them to think about where they want to be where they're 35. What are the goals for their midterm? I think that's, that's the second thing I would ask. The third thing I would ask is, do you want to be a global citizen or do you want to be a continental citizen? If you want to be a global citizen, then prepare yourself for that. It's a different set of goals. So I think the whole issue is a rational issue that well-educated children, young people, can address in a very, very rational way. And I think the final thing I would say is, Everybody makes mistakes. Never regret them, but correct them. But there's no such thing as a perfect world or a perfect life. So what I just showed you, I mean, the first part of it is actually indicating the idea of the shifter, but the second, the, the last sentence uh, indicates something which is methodologically important, which is also uh, uh, important in the way that we engage with the problems of our time. We should remember that we will always make mistakes. 
and our responsibility is to go back and correct the mistakes. Now, talking about shifts, let's. Uh, you, some of the points that you heard in His Highness's words is about being prepared for the world in which you're going to live. And this is not just for us, it's also for the generations to come because the response was uh, uh, to a question about advice to younger people. Going back to 70 years ago when His Highness became the Imam, the kind of institutions he had at his disposal in order to address the problems of the Ismaili community and the people among whom they lived was a lot more limited. What we see today is a massive proliferation of a huge number of institutions dedicated to improving the quality of life and to addressing emerging problems and new problems of various different communities of various generations in our times. And this is something that did not exist in the past. If you look at the vast array of educational institutions that His Highness has created, I mean, just look at everything which was available during the time of his grandfather, Sir uh, Sultan uh, Shah Khan III. We had educational institutions, housing institutions, I don't know, economic institutions. But what we have today is almost absolutely incomparable with what we had during the uh, previous that time of the previous imam. Looking at primary education, uh, early education, secondary education, tertiary education, the, the Institute of Ismaili Studies, the Aachen University, the, uh, the University of Central Asia, the Aachen Academies, you've got a vast range of these educational institutions, but it's not just about education. If you look at the structure of the AKVN, you would see that for almost every single sphere of life, sphere of human life, from the moment you're born to the moment that you die as a human being, the AKDN is doing something which addresses your different spheres of life. And this is an uh, integral way of looking at, at, at humanity. So what we see in the past 50 years is, an, is a, it's, it, it may seem very huge, but if you ask His Highness, he would probably tell you that this is just the beginning of it. So what we see in the form of the institutions of Ismaili Imamat, which includes the AKDN and also the other community institutions known as the Jamaati institutions, they are in a very simple way, means made available to the leadership of the community to be able to address the problems of the time in an efficient, in a competent manner, so that we could, we could hand over the future to the next generation in a way which is more responsible, which is more ethical. And of course, this is in the perspective of the Ismaili Imam, rooted in the history and the beliefs of the Ismaili community. And you could see it increasingly expanding in the work of the AKDN as new areas uh, emerge in it. I'll give you a very quick example that I'm uh, absolutely sure that the AKF family is very familiar with, and that has got to do with the issue of uh, climate resilience. So uh, 50 year years ago, the issue of climate change or global warming was not something that uh, humanity was really cognizant about, but now it has increasingly become part of every sensible, every intelligent human uh, organization, and you see it prominently appearing on the agenda of the AKDN, of AKF, and almost every single uh, imamate institution around the globe to take this into account. So the climate change is an example of an emerging problem for which you need to envisage new solutions, for which you need to have the wisdom so to speak, that using his highness's words, to come up with new solutions if your earlier solutions fail. And this is something that not every, every type of uh, leadership around the globe, including religious leadership, could actually offer to humanity. And thank you, Professor. I mean, you mentioned that now these AKDN institutions have expanded over the last 50 years to be able to cover every sphere of life. Um, and to respond to the problems of the time. I mean, you mentioned climate change, and we know it's not just one institution within AKDN that is responding to this. There is the research element, there is the, the school element, there is the community element. Um, and so there is this whole set of armory, let's say, to respond to, to the problems of climate change. I want to shift gears just a little bit because in move a bit away from the actual kind of the response and the work that the AKDN is doing and go back um, to His Highness's 2014 address to the Canadian Parliament in which he stated that 
Islam believes fundamentally that the spiritual and material worlds are inextricably connected. This connection, he explained, is why much of his focus has been on the work of the AKDN. Can you elaborate a bit on the meaning and the significance of this statement and explain if there are any attentions, tensions that arise when trying to balance and practice the spiritual and the material aspects of development? Uh, that extract that you mentioned uh, in uh, His Highness's speech in the Canadian Parliament is probably one of the most succinct uh, and the dense uh, narratives of the role and function of the Ismaili Muhammad in our times. And I think it builds upon the experience of the Ismaili Imam throughout uh, his lifetime, throughout his term in office, and also it reflects the realities on the ground. Now, in the way that His Highness explains this, there is something which needs a little bit of unpacking because it is an, a, a, it's still, still an ongoing issue in the way that the uh, rest of the world, that the entire world actually is understanding the role and the function of the Ismaili Imamat. And that is rooted in part in the uh, historical experience of uh, European societies and Western societies when it comes to understanding uh, faith communities, when it comes to understanding in particular Muslim communities and the Ismaili community. And that is the idea of the coexistence or the balance between faith and the world. The idea that a faith leader should be involved in these so-called material, mundane, profane, day-to-day -day affairs of life seems for some people incongruous with uh, a religious way of life. And that is precisely the point that the Ismaili Imam has been trying to convey uh, to the to, to, to different, different uh, constituents that Simply because I am the Imam, it does not mean that I should stay away from material life. It's indeed precisely because I am the Imam of a faith community that I am required to address not only the spiritual aspects of their lives, but also the material, the so-called mundane aspects of it. Now, this is rooted in the experience of European modernity, in the rise of the reason of enlightenment, in the Renaissance, in the uh, Reformation, in, in European societies. And you could see this sharp dichotomy, uh, this uh, binary which is created, uh, uh, which tells you that there should be a separation between the secular and the religious, between the spiritual and the material, between, the, uh, between tradition and modernity. And as a result, these, these very, uh, uh, sharp dichotomies drive a wedge between these two different, uh, uh, these two spheres of human life. And the Ismaili Imamat is simply telling you that it is not true to view uh, life, to view uh, uh, human needs in these sharp terms. So uh, you could very simply ask, is uh, the AKDN a secular institution or a religious institution? It's neither this nor that one because it's incorrect to see it as religious and it's also incorrect to see it as secular because that is based upon a completely different terminology. I'm going to show you an extract of uh, a few words that His Highness made in, in Aleppo in 2001 on the periphery of the uh, Khan of Art for Architecture. And it's particularly important to look at it because remember, we are talking about Syria, a country which has been involved over the past two decades in a uh, in a devastating civil war, which has which has damaged large parts of the country and also the region. And there you could see how this vision of His Highness is so poignantly important in the way that we understand not just our engagement with the world today, but also our understanding of modernity and our understanding of the role and function of His Highness as the Imam of the Ismaili community and the chairman of the AKDN. So let me show this one to you because in, in this uh, extract, His Highness captures this way of looking at modernity in, in, in our terms, in our language. So, sorry, I'm sorry, I need to get it back here. There you go. I would like to begin these short comments by saying how deeply happy I am to be back in Aleppo on this occasion and uh, to be able to 
welcome you to some work which the Aachen Trust for Culture has completed and to welcome you to some new projects which we hope to bring forward. The background to this initiative is very simple. Background is to illustrate to the peoples of our world the history of the civilizations of the Ummah. They don't know our history. They don't know our literature. They don't know our philosophy. We don't know, they don't know the physical environment in which our countries have lived. They view the Ummah in terminology which is completely wrong. My interest in working in Syria is to take the various lead countries of the Ummah and say, let's start, let's move together. Let's revive our cultures so that modernity is not only seen in the terminology of the West, but modernity is seen in the intelligent use of our past. Thank you. So the idea of looking at modernity as the intelligent use of our past rather than modernity as something which creates binaries such as tradition and modernity, the mundane and the profane versus the sacred, etc., etc., is not just His Highness's approach, but there is also a very strong sociological and philosophical argument behind it. And I'll just drop the name of Samuel Eisenstadt, a sociologist who speaks about multiple modernities rather than singular modernities, because there is this idea, and of course some reformists among Muslims argued that in order for Muslim populations to reach this level of advancement, they need to follow verbatim what the Europeans did, which means that you need to separate the church and the state, the secular and the religious, the mundane and uh, the profane and the sacred, etc., etc., and the long list of binaries like that. So the response of His Highness is that that is not accurate, that is not correct. It was built upon the European experience. It does not mean that every other human society should do it exactly the same way. There are different ways of dealing with these problems. And in the case of Muslim communities, the, the leadership of Muslim community and the life of Muslims does not mean that you should divorce your daily material life from your day-to-day -day spiritual or, or, or religious life that you've got. They are so interconnected, they are meshed into one another. It's so difficult to separate them because everything that you do in the physical world, if you're planting a tree, it is no less than worshiping your God because that is contributing to an integral vision of how you understand your own role as a trustee, as, as somebody who is responsible for handing over this earth to the next generations of people who will appear on earth. And by the time you're all going to be completely gone. Now, the reason that I brought that example from Syria is that, of course, you could see the very difficult situation in Syria, and it also reflects the kind of commitment that His Highness has got to improving the quality of life, not just in terms of short term interests. Because remember, what the AKDN does is not an example of a uh, venture capitalist uh, organization. It's not an example of a corporation, uh, contrary to what may often be seen. A corporation seeks to maximize its interest, its profit. The AKDN and Ismaili Imamat invest in a country for the long term. And when you run into a problem, when you have setbacks, you do not just withdraw. Uh, the examples of Afghanistan and Syria are prominent examples that despite all these uh, turbulences. The AKDN has remained on the ground and the Ismaili Imamat has never wavered to continue contributing to improving the quality of life of these people because the primary interest is not to go there and make money. The primary interest is go there and serve humanity and serve people regardless of their denominations. There is a very humanist approach to it and also a long-term vision that takes into account all the kinds of emerging problems that we run into. Thank you, Professor. I mean, that's 
very deep reflections. And I think for some of us, uh, that unlearning or that uh, defamiliarization, as you said, is quite important for those who have studied international development, who have been brought up in this view of the, di the dichotomy between the secular and the religious, and then how to grapple with that as we talk about AKF or AKDN being non-denominational, how we speak to donors and partners about that, how that actually plays out in practical conversations. It's very, very complex. Um, and a bit tricky um, to explain in very clear language that, you know, that balance of the spiritual and material. I mean, His Highness has also spoken of the balance between the faith and the intellect. And I think that's one point um, I'd like to ask you about before we, we move over to, to questions. Um, can you expand on that a bit more, the faith and the intellect balance? Uh, actually, this point about faith and intellect uh, really builds upon the earlier question. And again, it, just remember that we'll be talking about the rise of the reason of enlightenment, particularly after Immanuel Kant, when he wrote his very famous uh, article about what is enlightenment. Uh, one of the major issues that you could see in European societies was that if you look at faith, faith for them could be seen just as a matter of the heart and uh, this this. Uh, Orientalist version or this Eurocentric version of modernity would tell you that religious societies are about the the abundance of uh, magic, of superstitions, of dogmas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And therefore, a rational approach, a legal, rational, bureaucratic approach to running human society, is something which was not. Uh, aligned with a religious way of life. And if you want to become modern, you have to relinquish being a traditional uh, believer or a traditional faithful person. Now, this idea is, of course, very much European. Uh, I'm not saying that you cannot find examples of this view among uh, other Muslim communities. You could definitely find them, but in particular in the Ismaili tradition, and this is something which goes all the way back to the time of the Prophet, to the time of Imam Ali, his highness's ancestor, that matters of faith are inseparable with intellect. Uh, faith is another facet of intellect and vice versa. So the basic idea is that even in matters of faith, you do not just have the right, but you also have the duty to ask questions, to interrogate faith. Faith should be able to convince people should be able to win their hearts and mind. It is your right that when you engage with matters of faith, you can ask question and say, does this add up? Does this make any sense? Is this reasonable or not? So the reasonableness of faith is something which is integral to the Ismaili tradition. And of course, we've had many, many examples of it in the past and in contemporary times. And you see it in many, many interviews, in many uh, uh, speeches of His Highness that he points out the fact that in our tradition, faith is inseparable from intellect. And if you want to depict them differently, if you want to drive a wedge between faith and intellect, we are going to be betraying our intellectual heritage. And this is something which is very unique in the Ismaili tradition. And you need to keep them always in balance with one, one another. Revelation is not there to depreciate, to suppress and marginalize human intellect. Revelation and faith is there to enrich human intellect, to allow human intellect to flourish, not to put it in a corner and say, you don't have the understanding, you don't have the knowledge. They can work together and they're, they're, they're reinforcing one another in this perspective, which is why you could see uh, uh, the, the emergence and the expansion of so many educational institutions within the AKDN framework. Because remember, when you're talking about early education, where we are talking about the University of Central Asia, we are not talking about the religious seminary. We are talking about education in the very broadest sense of it. And that is that is incorporated within the, the broad vision of the Ismaili Imamat as to how you complement and you connect faith with intellect, which is why you need to create institutions for them in order to develop and in order to nurture and nourish human intellect.
Thank you, Professor. It's been so interesting hearing your thoughts and reflections on this and also the, the quotes that you've shared from His Highness. I mean, first of all, I would like to say that we already have had a comment come in uh, to say that how important it is for AKDN to hold such types of sessions, uh, at least potentially twice a year, um, to really discuss these issues and, and to hear and to hear the views of His Highness. Um, I'm going to lead with that into the first question, um, it, which kind of goes back to the faith view um, or the faith uh, point that you've been making, but goes a bit further. And the question is around His Highness's vision of Islam today and th th that view of atheism and atheists and how that's, how, how, how does that connect? Well, uh, there are a number of uh, points to, 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 to mention here. The first point is, of course, that His Highness is a religious leader. This is a faith community. The Ismaili Imam believes in God. And of course, that's the construct of, of the Ismaili community. That's the structure of how Ismailis believe in. But what does that tell you about the way that the Ismaili Imam looks at somebody who has got a different view of life, who's got a different opinion, who's got a different view of faith, who may not even be a believer. The very foundation of the AKDN is that you improve the quality of life of people without asking about their faith. Now, this is a humanist vision that the AKDN in areas where they are operating, when they are offering services in terms of education, healthcare, economic development, the key and the most question is not whether you are a Muslim or you're a uh, believe it in, in an Abrahamic faith or you have got a particular uh, uh, sexual orientation or you've got a particular gender or you come from a particular country. The key question, the most important criterion is that you are a human being. Every human being has the right to be treated in this way, to be treated in dignity, to be treated with respect and to be taken seriously. And in that case, an atheist is no different from any other human being. All, because when you're talking about an atheist, who are atheists? Are they machines? Are they angels? No, they are primarily human beings. We've got differences with them, but the differences does not mean that, and this is the very idea of pluralism, is that the differences that people have do not constitute the right for us to deprive them of their civil uh, uh, entitlements that they've got, of their human entitlements that you've got. So the background of faith does not ethically allow us to go and, and exclude other people from the kind of uh, services that we are supposed to be providing for them. So therefore, in this sense, it's not just about atheism, it's just about any other index of difference, whether it's in terms of creed or in terms of social status, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks. I think we can all, you know, call to call that when we're thinking our everyday lives that every human being has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. I'm I'm going to actually go to another question around what advice you have for us at AKDN on effectively streaming the concepts of pluralism, diversity, gender equality, and social inclusion in our efforts to improve the quality of life. So putting these putting these um, ethical principles into practice, given the varying levels of engagement with these ideas among teams, how can we align our language and terminology to enhance understanding and acceptance globally? Well, I think if you look at it the way that His Highness looks at it, we, we there is there is a there is a speech that His Highness uh, uh, made in in Canada, I think in Toronto, where he speaks about the role of leaders, uh, the, the, and he says that the most important test of moral leadership is in our times is to be able to bridge the gaps, to be able to fill those gaps which are there, not not to perpetuate binaries, not to polarize communities and societies. And unfortunately, in our times, we see too many examples of the kinds of leadership that polarize societies, that create binaries, that bring conflicts into, into human society. And it has nothing to do with uh, developing countries or with Middle Eastern countries. It happens globally all across the world. It happens in the US, it happens in Canada, it happens in Europe, and we've seen too many examples of it. So one of the functions of the AKDN and the Ismaili Imamat is that it offers a kind of model for leadership. 
Now, if you will allow me that latitude, I will call it the Aga Khan model, and that is something like the signature that you could see, because this is the signature of the Ismaili Imam in terms of its leadership, in terms of the institutions that he's created, in terms of even the building that he's made. I mean, you could go visit any uh, Imamate institutions, any building that the AKDN has created, and it would be at the, the unmistakable signature of the Aga Khan is in every building that he makes it. So we are looking at an example of leadership which is aimed at bringing harmony, at bringing uh, synchronization, at bringing a balance between uh, uh, the faith and the intellect, between the faith and the world, and in opening up to the other who is not like us. And if you allow me, I'm going to show you a, uh, uh, an extract from uh, His Highness's speech in, in Harvard, because it, that's one of the most important things that His Highness incorporates into this vision of pluralism and cosmopolitan ethic, is that once you're serving people, you do not look for the common grounds between you and other people. You don't say that, OK, we are Muslims, you're Christians or Jews, and we've got this Abrahamic face. Let's agree on what we agree upon and forget about our differences. His Highness's approach is that it's, it's exactly the opposite. We are not there to eliminate the difference, to disregard them, to downplay them. Our job is to make them more prominent, make them more visible, to appreciate them, to recognize them and to acknowledge them. So let me show this. Uh, uh, very quickly, if I may, uh, this is uh, this is the extract. The pluralist cosmopolitan society is a society which not only accepts difference, but actually seeks to understand it and to learn from it. In this per perspective, diversity is not a burden to be endured, but an opportunity to be welcomed. Cosmopolitan society regards the distinctive threads of our particular ident identity as elements that bring beauty to the larger social fabric. The cosmopolitan ethic accepts our ultimate moral responsibility to the whole of humanity rather than absolutizing a presumably exceptional part. Perhaps it is a natural condition of an insecure human race to seek security in a sense of superiority. But in a world where cultures increasingly interpen interpenetrate one another, a more confident and a more generous outlook is needed. What this means perhaps all else, is a readiness to participate in a true dialogue with diversity, not only in our personal relationships, but in institutional and international relationships also. But that takes work and it takes patience. Above all, it implies a readiness to listen. What is needed as the former Governor General of Canada Adrian Clarkson has said, and I quote, is a readiness to listen to your neighbor, even when you may not particularly like him. Is that message clear? You listen to people you don't like. So that is a very difficult test to really listen to people you don't like, because it's very easy to agree with the people you agree. It's difficult to listen to the one that you just don't like, that you don't agree with, and to be able to listen to them, to learn from them, and to sort of expand your the, the limits of your own knowledge and to be able to correct your own mistakes. It's a very difficult thing, and it's also a moral test in terms of how intellectually humble we can be, rather than absolutizing our own position and say that we are exceptionally knowledgeable, we are the chosen people, we are the good people, we are going to go to paradise after death and the rest of the people are going to go to hell. And this is something which is, which flies in the face of what His Highness describes as that kind of moral humility of recognizing, of appreciating our own creaturehood before the divine. And of course, you could see that this vision runs through the AKDN 
without turning that idea into a theological statement, without turning it into a political weapon, into a polemical tool to exclude and to eliminate others who do not think like us. You have an institution which is deeply based on faith and at the same time you do not see any element which would exclude any non-Ismaili in participating in the work, in contributing to the work and in serving humanity at large in the very broadest sense of it. And we have this exemplary leadership set by His Highness and also what you call the Aga Khan model of leadership. Um, someone has come in with a question to ask, what are some examples of the cosmopolitan ethic and action from outside the AKDN? Individuals, companies, NGOs, CSOs that embody this ethic in an exemplary way? Well, that's a very good question. You have to look at it from a socio-political context. Uh, you see a number of these uh, international organizations that are dedicated to improving the quality of life of humanity at large. There are many non-governmental institutions, and I emphasize non-governmental because if you look at the AKDN, the AKDN is pretty much categorized in the range of civil society institutions. It's probably not like any other civil society institution, but you can categorize it there because the Ismaili Imam does not own a land, it doesn't govern any nation state, it doesn't have any kind of political power, it doesn't have an army, it doesn't have an intelligence apparatus or things like that. All it has at its disposal is excellence, is education, is competence and a moral leadership. We see a lot of these organizations that are dedicated to improving the quality of life, whether they are in terms of uh, promotion of human rights, in terms of promotion of education for all people. I'll just give you one example of, of institutions that are dedicated to improving the educational access of women in, in, in marginalized societies. Just look at the case of a place like Pakistan where uh, women are suffering uh, because they have now lost their access to education contrary to what they had 20 years ago. It's not going to be a magical thing, but these small measures, these small steps taken in different parts of the world to improve these conditions are fundamentally important. The other example that I could give you, and it's not just uh, 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 the AKDN, but you could also find it in other civil society institutions, uh, is the way that they contribute to the built environment, that they work on spaces which are built for human beings. And when you're building a space, a physical space, a building does not, when you enter a building, the building does not ask you what you believe in. The building does not ask you whether you're a man or a woman. If you design a building in such a way which is inclusive, which is open to the needs of other human beings, then of course it is, it is exactly on the same lines as we see it. Uh, uh, you could see other institutions. I mean, the, the Catholic Church uh, uh, has done, has created some of these institutions. You could look at international organizations like the Amnesty International, uh, 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 organizations which deal with civil society issues, with architecture, with healthcare, etc. And they generally operate in impoverished countries and in developing countries. But of course, I don't think that any of them has got that kind of remit that the AKDN has. I mean, you could look at an NGO which focuses on education only, but the AKDN does not just focus on education. There are so many different areas that the AKDN is, is addressing that a single NGO cannot really address. So it's more than anything else, the mission and the mandate of civil society that fills the gap between the people and the citizens in a, in a country, in a society, and the state, where in many cases the states uh, uh, do not have the capacity, do not have the mandate, or do not have the interest to fill those gaps. And of course, the civil society could do it without necessarily trying to replace the states. So it's, it's, it's a non-confrontational, it's a non-frictional way of contributing to development in these countries. Uh, without uh, getting into a political uh, 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 rivalry, so to speak, with any any kind of a specific nation state setting. I, I tried to mention it as broad as I could. I'm sorry, I couldn't think of a specific uh, uh, 
uh, uh, organizations or NGOs right now. There, there's plenty of them. I'm sure you know them a lot better than me. I just wanted to mention Amnesty International, but I was thinking how does Amnesty International fit in this narrative? There are plenty of other things like that. It's my absent-mindedness at the end of this long talk. That's very good, very comprehensive. I have another question um, coming in too around um, a, a kind of uh, implementation of these values. So most most in NGOs have visions and policies that encompass globally recognized ethical and humanitarian principles. The challenge, however, is translating these into practice and culture. How can we ensure adherence to these principles at the field level, particularly in the face of job competition, work pressures, and shifting management styles? In simpler terms, how can we effectively transform our vision and mission into reality and ensure institutional commitment to these values? So there's one word that I would just use here, and I think that that word is sort of incorporated in the pluralistic uh, and the cosmopolitan approach of the AKDN as well, and that word is empathy. Because uh, this is the fundam the golden rule of justice, by the way. Treat others as you want to be treated uh, uh, by them. So when I'm a manager, I've got an employee and I'm dealing with them. They are human beings. Uh, they have their own agencies. They've got the same kind of feelings that I have. If I treat my employee in a way uh, that is not empathetic, that does not take into account the kind of human needs that they have, and I forget about that empathy there, how would I expect others to treat me? So this is a uh, this is this uh, idea that that you treat the other in the same way that you want them to treat you, and I think that's a very basic thing. It doesn't need any kind of sophisticated training. You don't need rocket science. You don't need to be a philosopher. You don't want to be lied to. Don't lie to people. You don't want to be hurt. Don't hurt people. There is this line in a Hasidah by Nasr Khosrow, the famous medieval Ismaili philosopher and and poet. And in which he says that uh, uh, once you get hold of a sword, you cannot just go ahead and kill kill people. And then there is this line. He says, "Angosht makon ranjbe dar kuftan kast, ta kast nakonat ranjbe dar kuftanat mosht." Do not use uh, your fist to bit people, to 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 punch people, because if if you use your finger to hurt people, then people would easily give themselves the right to punch you in the face. You hurt people, people will hurt you back. Now, twist it around. Be kind to people, people will be kind to you. So it's it's a very human level of dealing with issues of justice and morality, and it does not need to be very sophisticated. I know that on the ground, it's not always easy. People will have to make sacrifices. There aren't always easy solutions to choosing, for example, justice over freedom or freedom over justice. It's an imperfect world but we need to work within the parameters of an imperfect world, and we need to address the solutions to the best way that we can. Thank you, Professor. I know we're almost at time, but there's one last question I wanted to ask you that was raised, and actually this has to do with social media. We know His Highness did speak about this. Um, in depth in his Brown address. Um, in today's globalized and rapidly changing world where social media platforms amplify both connections and conflicts among individuals, what ped pedagogical strategies would you recommend for educators and parents to effectively teach cosmopolitan ethics and help the new generation embrace this concept as part of their daily practice? Uh, remember, when you're talking about pluralism and cosmopolitan ethic, it is based on the idea that in an increasingly globalized world, many borders are fading away and many more people come into contact with one another. And of course, the social media and the Internet has sort of uh, catalyzed that kind of interaction. Now, having more encounters with people does not always mean that you'll have more tolerance that you'll have a better understanding of them. So before having more encounters with people who are different from you in terms of their gender, in terms of their creed, in terms of their social status, in terms of their skin color, et cetera, et cetera, we require a deeply moral training of being able to uh, not just tolerate the other, but also to take the other as 
one like ourselves because uh, when I catch a cold, I feel exactly the same the same kind of pain that I don't know a brown person feels, a black person feels, a rich person feels, an old person feels, an atheist feels, and those differences do not make the slightest difference in the kind of pain that I go through. So it's really important to take it into account that we have to see the social media. Of course, it's an opportunity because it allows us to encounter the people, the kind of people that we've never encountered before and to come up with different forms of diversity that we were not aware of before. But before that, we need to have that kind of training that once we see somebody who's not like us, are we capable of? Do we have the latitude? Do we have the uh, stomach to really uh, address that kind of difference, that kind of diversity in a way that does not become exclusivist, in a way that does not eliminate the other simply because they're not like us? And I think it is both a challenge and also a threat, and it's up to us to prepare ourselves for it. I think the most important element of it is education. And it's no surprise that you find so much emphasis in the AKDN and in the example of the Ismaili Muhammad on education from the lowest level to the highest level of it. Education, I think, is fundamentally important. When you're highly educated, you will be able to develop those kinds of tools to address diversity in a way which is more intelligent, which is more ethical, which is more inclusive of the world in which you live. Thank you, Professor. We're at time. I just want to thank you for such a rich conversation today. I think everyone can agree it's been so interesting to embark on this discussion and think about how we ourselves can put the cosmopolitan ethic into action and continue this great work. So thank you so much for today and thank you everyone who joined us.